All right, welcome to episode 36 of the At Bat Podcast presented by War Media, where we give you our thoughts on the latest Chicago baseball news as well as take a trip around the league. I am Saul Rodriguez, joined by the other my other co-host, Miles Porter, and we're joined by, of course, as always, Gabriel Wilkins and Chris Pennant, our war colleagues, uh, on this holiday special uh, as uh, Christmas is coming up this weekend. Uh, how are we doing today, Miles? Doing good. I got my Northwestern Christmas hat on, feeling very... Uh... Feeling very holiday-ish. It's not a word. Um, yeah, happy to be back. <laughs> had, to miss, had to miss the last one because I had to go to the DMV because of my birthday. I turned 26. So that was fun. It's always fun going to the DMV. Uh, that's sarcasm. And it's great to see everybody again. <laughs> hey, how, hey how'd, how'd you like how'd you like the the, pic, the picture I used for you, though? The... I loved it. That was hilarious. <laughs> I saw that. <laughs> Charlie Brown. Hey, uh, Gabe, how you doing, man? I'm doing well. I can't complain, man. Just trying to stay warm, man. You know, in preparation for this blizzard, not knowing what to expect, but just grateful to be uh, alive and living during the holiday season yeah, once again. What about you, Chris? How's it going? Oh, you know, after those two very incredibly positive um, responses, I feel like I should be negative, but things are <laughs> things are all right. Hey, hey I know things, hey. things are okay. <laughs> I, I, I was before you got on. I was actually I was telling Gabe. I'm like, I guess if you want like a slightly negative one, I, I'm just getting I'm over being sick. It's just been uh, congestion oh, for like a week, go. and it's been yeah, it's been it's been really whack. But it, I'm Going getting around. over it finally. Yeah, yeah, I've had the exact same thing. Yeah, there you go. But uh, it's it's what's what it like what it's like living in the Midwest, man. Being like the and anytime the cold hits, somebody's getting sick. Uh, yeah. but when it comes to uh. Chicago baseball, there's a lot of positives, at least, to go on r- around right now, uh, surprisingly. Uh, but we'll start on the north side of Chicago first. Uh, uh, of course, the Cubs made a move for uh, Dansby Swanson. Uh, they also signed Brad Boxberger over the last week. Um, but, of course, that, that Swanson deal was seven years, $177 million. And the Cubs finally, they got their shortstop. You know, they were talking about it. You know, people, you know they were hinting at it at the end of uh, the season. And people were like, oh, is it going to be Correa? Is it going to be Trey Turner? No, it was Dansby Swanson. But it's still a very talented shortstop for a great price because I know a lot of people were talking about, um, you know, oh, like they're overpaying or blah, 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 this and whatever. But with the way the market is, this is a, is, I think they got him at, at, at like at a really gr- like great deal, especially for the amount of years they got him too. Uh, but we'll start with you, Miles. What, what did you think overall about the Dansby Swanson deal? And about the even about the Brad Boxberger deal because even that that one's honestly it's it's an underrated deal as a guy who who has been yeah. consistent and he he pitches you know every couple of days for you and he's gonna um you know have an ERA of you know high twos low threes type thing and you know what would you think? Yeah, I love it. I love the moves all around. I think uh, Swanson kind of brings that leaderish presence that we have from like Rizzo and KB. Um, not like trying to put him in the same category, mm. but it's good to kind of have that veteran leadership. Um, you know, on the north side um, and just, you know, along with the player that's in his prime um, has a very good head on his shoulders. I think he fits in here like a glove. Uh, amazing move by the Cubs. I'm so happy that we got him. Um, and, you know, Brad Bosberg, another good setup guy, kind of adds to the depth of that arm, of that bullpen, brings a good arm over there. Uh, we saw how talented, that, you know, that bullpen is on the second half last year. And I think he kind of adds a more wholesome, uh, you know, you know, getting arms out of that pen. Um, and, you know, kind of having us complete games better. Uh, I love it. I love, I love the moves that the Cubs have been making. And, you know, they're staying on top of it. I think we're still one or two moves away before I mm. feel like we are going to be something significant. Um, but the Cubs are on their way to being uh, fairly competitive. I like the path that we're on. And, you know, either way, it should be a very fun 2023 season. Yeah. What did you think, Gabe, on the signing? I kind of think they overpaid for Swanson, but as you alluded to, mm-hmm. Paul, introducing his point, that was just the way of the market. Mm-hmm. And when you consider the fact that the Cubs, which in my opinion, didn't really have a face of the franchise after Wilson Contreras departed for the arch rival St. Louis Cardinals, you had to get one. And to come away from this free agency – with one of the top shortstops, albeit the shortstop who, while younger, has more questions than the likes of the Bogarts, the Correas, and the Trey Turners of the world, it's a plus. And he wanted to be here. And he wanted to be a Cub. 
I think relationships played a role in that with his wife being a, a soccer player for the Red Stars. That didn't hurt. And I think he could contribute to the organization right away. He gives them a guy who's been to places where these young guys are trying to go. And that's a World Series, playing LCS rounds and all throughout the playoffs in his career in Atlanta. This is this is a perfect stop for him to be that veteran guy and really show what leader he's he truly is in a clubhouse that's going to need his leadership alongside of the likes of not only David Ross as the manager, but Cal Hendricks and other key veterans on this current Cubs roster. Go ahead, Chris. Yeah, it's I think for a guy who's been playing in the majors full time for six years already. There's still some upside to it. I know we talked about it last uh, couple of, I think two weeks ago or last week where, you know, he wasn't the, necessarily the best guy out there. Right. But, and I think the the trouble with the signing was where are you going to move Horner? If you have a guy who's played full-time shortstop, if you, if you can't swing Xander Bogarts, who's at least spent some time at other positions on the infield. But I agree with what Miles said. I think it provides a lot of veteran leadership and playoff experience. Guy who's finished top 20 in MVP voting twice. Um, and is it's a positive signing. And what Gabe said, the contract is at market value. So with the additions that they made, putting getting Bellinger in the outfield on a one-year prove-it deal, no. um, adding Boxberger to the bullpen, which I think, I think we're going to touch on in a second, that's... Um, he he's had some ups and downs, but I think that's the nature of things for a reliever. Um, I am personally in favor of guys who don't strike out a high number of batters because I think their careers are just more volatile with arm injuries and, you know, the different types of pitches and, you know, the unsaid things that we that pitchers have to do to, in order to stay relevant. <clears throat> so I think hitting a guy who's more of a ground ball type pitcher that pitches to contact out of the bullpen, but soft contact and has, the ERA plus that he's had over the last three seasons is a great signing. And Swanson overall, this shows that the Cubs are willing to spend a little bit of money um, in order to compete. And we got to remember the landscape of the MLB is changing next year, not just with the new rules for pitch timing and pitch clock, but you're not playing your division every um, mm -hmm. you know, 19 times a season. So you're going to make moves that are based on beating the league and not the other four teams there. And that's what Dansby Swanson does. Yeah, and that's what I like. And, you know, with the, the, you know, the baseball world going into more analytics, which I, which I like analytics and I like just in general, like, I like both of the, th you know, the things with the, with the feel and analytics and all that. I like both things. I feel like you can't win without both of them. And I feel like Dansby Swanson is a good mixture of both, especially last year. He, you know, had a 5.7 war um, and is a guy that's going to be, you know, that looks like, looks like. And again, it's one of those things where I think they're also paying for what he can be. You know, because he hasn't he hasn't necessarily been the player he was last year, his whole career. La you know, last year was the takeoff point and what, you know, a lot of people feel that hey, that's what, he, you know, that's what it could be. And if he's like that every year, you know, then it'll be, you know, be worth it. So I think also with his defense, too, I think it's what what is more uh, uh, that makes this deal, you know, a little more exciting because the defense up the middle with him and Nico is going to be, you know, pretty elite. And you, and you got also not even counting Cody Bellinger in center. Uh, up the middle so in, you know it, it's it's a really uh fascinating deal and i hope that you know it all works out in in, in the end and yeah and and uh you know as it gave you you just mentioned right now with the him being a gold glove shortstop you know I, I actually almost forgot that too i was like yeah when i wasn't even thinking about that i was talking about his offense all the time you know um because it's oh and especially with his postseason uh you know his experience and i feel like he's clutch in in, in october and it's it's one of those things where he said some big home runs and, and I just think about that and, and I looked at his numbers. They're not like, you know, they don't stand out or anything, but the mo moments he's hit, you know, that he's uh, chosen to hit those home runs have been in big spots. And I feel like that's big for a team that, you know, is for, you know, getting younger and younger and less, less and less experience on the Cubs roster um, is, I think it's a big deal. And I think it'll, you know, it'll hopefully uh, turn out for the best. Um, on the other side of town, though, the White Sox also made a big deal of uh, finally, right? I mean, they they got their their left handed uh, a bat and an outfielder uh, in Andrew Benintendi, another All Star, um, who's coming off a solid, like a really solid year. He was an All Star last year, so uh, we'll start with you, uh, uh, Gabe. What, what what were your initial thoughts on this? I mean, I know that for like the last couple of years, maybe even longer, I could, I could be wrong on that, but I think uh, 
White Sox fans have wanted that left-handed bat, um, you know, that could, you know, also, you know, give you some solid defense. And obviously he's got, you know, you know, solid defense out there. So uh, what, what were your initial thoughts on Benintendi signing? I love the signing, especially when you consider the way in which the game is going with the bands of shifts. I think he's a hitter that will benefit greatly from that. I think this is a guy that you can plug in right away as your number two hitter. He's a very disciplined hitter. He doesn't strike out a lot. And that makes him the anti-opposite of a lot of hitters in this White Sox lineup that are mostly power hitting types guys who are either high risk, high reward. You know what you're getting with Bennington. Yes, the home run numbers aren't as high compared to most outfielders that were on the open market, but he puts the barrel to the ball. He can hit the ball into the gaps and he provides you solid gold glove quality play defensively in left field. And that's what this team needed. And in a way, it kind of reminds me of a signing. And I want to, I want to give a shout out to my friend, Dominic Casaretto, who's a White Sox fan. And he brought this up to me the day that it happened. Kind of reminds me of when the Cubs signed Ben Zobris, mm-hmm. a guy who is just a pure hitter and is a discipline hitter, knows the zone and stuff, won't go out and chase. And it, and what it what it shows me is that relationships matter. Ben Intendi had the best year of his career besides Pedro Grafal, who was on that Royal staff, as well as Mike Tozar, who was the hitting coach on that Royal staff, both of whom are now part of the White Sox staff, is the manager in Grafal and is a, is a hitting instructor in Tozar. So I, I really like what I'm seeing with this signing, and I think he's a guy that provides stability. And as a result of it, you don't have to worry about seeing Eloy Jimenez full time out in left field anymore. And on paper, the White Sox have arguably the best outfield defensively that they've had in the last decade or so. Ben Intendi in left, Luis Robert in center field, and Oscar Colas soon to be eventually in right field. Go ahead, Chris. I think it's good. You needed to sign an outfielder um, that wasn't just a minor league signing like Billy Hamilton or Victor Reyes. Um, I, I personally like Victor Reyes, honestly. I, I think that there's more for him to be able to to do to succeed on this level. But signing Ben Intendi is a solid move. Um, everything that Vic gave said is correct. He's a guy who can cover the corner. He hits for a good average, which is not really as important in baseball as it used to be. But he's a guy who will get you two bases, with, whether with his speed or whether hitting the ball into the gaps. Um, I would I would argue that his best year of his career were those sec- those two full time years in Boston, his first two year full t- full time years, even though he struck out more than a hundred times because he, you know, partially because he was in a lineup where I think he could get more chances to crack the ball over the wall. That being said, you need to sign somebody else, um, if not necessarily for the outfield. I wouldn't block Colas. I think that you have to have another good signing for the rotation in order for this to match the Ben Zobris signing. When the Cubs signed Ben Zobris, they were already contending for a National League title or a World Series at that point. So picking up Ben Zobris was a leadership guy who was hard to strike out, who was of the mold of those Tampa Bay and Royals teams that were just that would just peck you to death. The Sox aren't in that position yet, whether they want to think so or not, because of how bad last year was. So you're going to go with Gavin Sheets in right field for however long that lasts. We're not exactly sure when Colas is coming up, whether he's going to be like an Eloy Jimenez where the fans just demand it until it happens. And for this signing to have truly have merit, those guys that we did mention in the outfield, um, Eloy, who's going to be playing designated hitter for the majority of the time, and Luis Robert have to stay healthy and mash the hell out of the baseball because Ben Intendi isn't necessarily going to be that guy who's going to get you 25 home runs. So those guys have to do it. It's their team along with Tim Anderson's now and Yohan Mikado. So they're going to have to show up in a way that wasn't present last year. And that's not, it can't just all be on a change in the managerial staff. Yeah. And I was going to say that that's what I was going to say about the, the signing also puts uh, Eloy at DH which, uh, you know, obviously benefits the Sox a lot more in that case. So it's just a lot of things that fall, a lot of things fall into place with this signing. But you're right. So, and, and we'll definitely get there because I do want to know what, uh, what, what, what's one thing 
uh, one, one, one more move before the end of the year uh, you guys want for your team. But, uh, Miles, go ahead. What did you think about this Benintendi signing? I like it. I think I think every single point I've heard, I, I completely agree with. Um, and, the, and kind of the point that you just made in terms of, you know, putting Eli more in the, in the DH spot, um, I, I like it. I like how balanced uh, Benintendi is as a hitter. Um, I, he's also extremely solid defensively. Um, yeah, kind of adds to that depth. And, and you know, and, and I'm, I'm going to continue to say it. I've said it every single episode since we started back in April. Uh, this, this White Sox team, the potential is, is through the roof. So, you know, a mixture of them staying healthy and, and, and guys just performing and playing their roles, you know, like 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 we, you guys just alluded to, Ben and Teddy is not going to be someone who's going to pop 25, 30, but he is going to get on base. He is going to work the count. He can't set someone up like Luis Robert or, or Aloy Jimenez to, to drive him in. It's those kind of things that I'm really uh, that I'm really looking forward to uh, with the White Sox, kind of adding a more balanced approach in terms of that lineup. Not everyone, um, you know, not having a lineup where everyone is kind of just going going for it in terms of you know just getting the big the big extra base hit, getting that home run and knocking in whoever's on base. I kind of like the mixture of a little bit of small ball in there with more strategic hitting. I think that's great for the White Sox. The more balanced that this team is, the more dangerous the White Sox will continue to be for any team that they play against. And I'm not counting them out at all uh, in 2023 in their division with the Guardians. I'm not. I think the White Sox are going to be right back up there. I think they're they're already they've, they've hit the reset button pretty well to this point. Maybe one or two moves kind of you know sets them up you know for sure in my opinion. Uh, but the White Sox are right there. I think signing Benintendi is huge, especially for making up somewhat making up for the presence of Jose Abreu. So, you know, yep. it kind of changes their strategy a little bit offensively, but it changes it in a good way. They're not losing anything. Now they just got to hit a little bit differently. Um, Sox going to be right there. I like it. I like it a lot. And to add to your point on that, Miles, like you said, when you lose a guy like Jose Abreu, granted, who has more power than Ben Intendi, even yep. in a down year, you need guys like that at the top of your order. And – He's also a guy who's won a World Series championship. I think a lot of people forget that when he was in Boston. He has playoff experience at the highest level. Yeah. That's something that this team is missing. Granted, they have had that in the past, but most of those guys that won were pitchers, such as Lance Lynn and Dallas Keuchel, who's no longer in Chicago as we speak. But now... Yeah, I, I know, right? <laughs> but, but, yeah, like, I mean, you, you, you need position players who've been through that day-to-day -day grind to show these yeah. guys what it's like. And at some point, how to get paid in the league as it currently changes. Because it's not going to be in starting next season to just be a home run or bus type of hitter, especially with the ban of shifts. Mm -hmm. Andrew Benintendi can play in, in any period or, or style. And I think with the shift man that this benefits him greatly and I wouldn't be surprised if he hits at least 10 or more home runs or 10 or 15 home runs and guarantee Ray Field where the ball flies during yeah. the summer months yeah yeah and actually you make a good point there that... oh go ahead I was gonna say it depends on what what style of baseball that the league puts in play this year too right yeah that's true right because you never know like I think it was like it came out uh not no one I only decide with with the ball right and like it came out where it was like supposedly they used three different balls throughout the year last season. Yo, wow. man, you're pissing me off, bro. <laughs> that's that's, that's ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Yeah, it just makes you two strikes instead, instead of three. <laughs> 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 no, take it. You know what? Take it all the way back. Five balls yeah. for a walk, four four strikes for a strikeout. There you go. <laughs> yeah, two no, outs I mean, for inning, by the way. It's only yeah. two outs. Leave the game up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> put, a, put a keg back at second base. <laughs> Babe Ruth's gonna uh, gonna rise from his grave just to play again. If he yeah, yeah. Okay against second base, probably. you do great, Babe. You play great. You fit in perfectly. <laughs> yeah, no, and uh, and oh, to to what to your point, Gabe, where you're saying about the home runs, and and I did forget to mention this with Swanson is that uh, somebody said uh, that it, um, if you uh, if Swanson would have played all all of his games at Wrigley, he would have hit 33 home runs instead of 27. Uh, last year or 25, I think yeah, yeah, last year. So uh, I think uh, that it's another reason. I think that might you know one of the reasons they might have got him is you know his power probably works maybe better at, at Wrigley. So, but yeah, with uh with that being said, uh I did wanted to uh, have a little segment here as we, you know Christmas is coming up. So uh with the the year you know the the end of the year also coming up. What's one thing 
if you could, by the end of this year, obviously the off season, you know, there's still a couple months up to the off season, but what's one thing you would, you you want your team to get? What's one thing you want under the, under the Christmas tree? Uh, if you had to pick just one for your team, uh, we'll start with you, Gabe. What, what would be one thing you would want the White Sox to get, you know, before the, the year is over? Prior to what transpired today, and I know we're going to get into it, mm -hmm. I would have told you hitting Gene Segura would have been my top priority if I was the Chicago White Sox. But now, after the recent events to unfold over the last 24 hours, I want to know what the market – price is for Brett Beatty. Put him in third and move your own Moncada to second. And I think you got something solid on the south side. Well, Especially with something that's transpiring that's going to involve an all-star player having to switch positions. What did you say, Chris? I couldn't, I, um, it, I couldn't tell who um, oh, Brett Beatty. you said, Gabe. Brent oh, Beatty. Okay. Yeah, Brent Beatty. What about you, Chris? Who, who do you want uh, un under the Christmas tree for the White Sox? A new owner, you know. <laughs> um, hey, you, hey, hey, wait, did you guys? I want to know actually. Did you guys uh, 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 put some money into that? I, did, I did not know about that. I did not. Know <laughs> I heard that about that. On. No, I didn't put no money in it. <laughs> yeah, I'm not a guy who goes in for for stuff like that mostly, <laughs> just because it's like. I don't know that that's not going to change anything of note, really. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No. Um, you know, you can, as we've seen, um, high-profile campaigns do more to unseat <laughs> yeah. political um, assholes than um, <laughs> billboards do. But it would be great. Jerry, Jerry's just going on the on the side of his career where I think he has more things to concern himself with. It's like, yo, just go enjoy the rest of your life. Uh, don't leave it in the, the hands of your kids who don't really who don't really want to do this stuff, like like how Yankees fans I think were feeling about Hal Steinbrenner, and find somebody who is willing to who to put the money up to run a team of this caliber the way it should be run. Exactly. That's all. That, I would take that. Oh yeah, hundred percent. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, how about we sign a catcher? That'd be fun, you know. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> I think, I think we, uh, you know, I think, I don't know. I, I do, I do look forward to the emergence of Miguel Amaya. Um, I'm still pretty set that he is not ready. Um, I know we've had issues with injuries, um, and I know some of his numbers in the minors over the years hasn't been great. I love, I'd love to see, I'd love to see a catcher. Um, and for me specifically, I'm looking at Jorge Alfaro or maybe even Gary Sanchez. Mm -hmm. Now, I know Gary Sanchez isn't the best defensive behind the plate. I know, mm -hmm. but you know, thank goodness there's a DH in the National League now. Um, so I think <laughs> yeah. that there is there's some creative platooning. Uh I think I think there's some creative platooning that they could do there, uh, in terms of kind of mixing Gary between the catching spot uh and DH. I know we got Matt Mervis coming up eventually as well. We got Alfonso Rivas at first base as well. Um, there's a lot of movement that they that the Cubs can do. Um but I think I think, you know, really setting us up at the catcher position, not just from an offensive standpoint, but from a defensive standpoint, someone who can call a game, someone uh, a good battery uh, that these guys coming out of the bullpen, these guys in the rotation can really trust. Uh, that's important. Jan Gomes is great, but this is what, what probably his last year. Did Jan Gomes isn't the player who's going to change this organization in terms of uh, helping the pitchers out. And Miguel Amaya isn't ready, so I just think you know maybe signing someone for that catch position could be very beneficial for the Cubs to add more in the terms of being competitive going into next. Oh yeah, I, I agree. And uh, also, you know, that kind of plays into what I'm, what, what I would want for the Cubs and, and it would probably be, you know, a first baseman or even another pitching signing, uh, something mm -hmm. like that, like a, um, I don't know, like a, for pitching, maybe like a Nate Eovaldi or for, for first base, like a, you know, like Trey Mantini, I, I hear they're in the market. Yeah. Um, but even like, or even like a Dominic Smith as well. I know they, they've had a conversation with them too. Yeah. Um, that would be another thing too, is because he, as you said, we're still, the Cubs are still a few pieces away from even being um, anywhere near the playoff conversation um, yeah. because yeah, it's like, because ultimately when you really look at it, it's, it's yes, there's another, there's an extra playoff, uh, 
you know, spot in the NL. It makes it a little more inviting for teams to try. But when you look at the National League, and we'll get into what happened in New York overnight with Correa, there's not there's not going to be a – let's face it, as of right now, there's not going to be a second postseason team in the National League Central. There's right. just not. I mean, there's not. And if there is – if there is, I would be, I'll be floored. I'd be shocked. So, uh, it, the, there's probably going to be three, you know, t- uh, postseason teams coming out of the the East, and and um, if not more, whatever. But it's just, yeah, it, it's it's just not going to happen. So I think the Cubs, you know, at, at this point, just make a run for it, and I think they're they're going to need, you know, another pitcher to even at least make a run for it. Um, so it, it'll be nice if they could do one of those before the end of the year. But I, I'm I'm still pretty confident that they'll they'll make a another signing um another you know solid signing before the end of the off season like a tie on type thing um and i will say this too miles to what you were talking about with the catchers is that um i think that you know regardless if like we're we're gonna, i think they're going to get a catcher it just it just it depends on who on who's who it's going to be but yeah i i think they do actually uh not that they're going to start uh yang going for 120 games but they i think they do i feel like they do like yan to start for most of the games because of the way he handles yeah, yeah. the pitching staff, yeah, which, yeah. which he does, but but like at, you know, I understand that at the end of the day, the offense uh, compared to other guys is not going to be there. And I really do like it. Sounds crazy, but I do like the Gary Sanchez thing because of his versatility in the lineup that he could also be DH. Because right. let's say moving him around, I just, yeah, I think that'd be so beneficial for him. Yeah, and let's say he catches fire, and like you want to start Jan because you know defense uh, behind the behind the plate, and so, you know you could put Gary at DH, and it kind of fills a couple of the voids, but. Um, and, 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 you know, whether Gary is good at defense or not, he has an arm and I yeah. guess, you know, in some way they could, you know, come in, come in handy. But, uh, again, uh, there's definitely a lot to, uh, go on there. And one, you know, one more thing before, uh, we shift to the rest of the league. Um, I don't know if you guys saw, but that the MLB network tweeted out a picture of, uh, the Cubs lineup with like the eye emoji. Uh, oh, yeah. and, and, and I mean, that was Either, it's either one of two things. They either got a Cubs fan and MLB network that's overexcited for no reason. <laughs> or or they, that was or that was tweeted out by a Cardinals White Sox fan or something that just that hates us and knows we were gonna get cooked because the, the Cubs got absolutely obliterated in those replies. Like yeah, just was... no mercy. Yeah, no, can I, no can mercy. I say something? Can I say something? And I mean yeah, this go. in the most loving, respectful <laughs> way possible. This is coming from a diehard Cubs fan. No one's looking at our lineup thinking of that. No, there's no uh, one yeah, right? looking at a lot of things. Oh my god! No, <laughs> no nobody. No, no. Right now, right? We're not. We're not there yet. We're not no. there yet. But people are looking at them like, okay, there, there goes the cousin. No one's looking at our lineup thinking to myself, oh, here, here, here they come. No, I know, right? Yeah, I was like, come on, come on, man. I was like, come, yeah. like, and it's like, and also not even that, but um, one of my friends was like, also, it's just the lineup optimization was horrible in there too. It was like. Nico Horner leading off, then it's Swanson too, which I don't have a problem with Swanson too, but uh, not Nico yeah. necessarily at, 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 you know, I feel like you could put Seiya up there. Uh, then, you know, it's just the lineup optimization was all over the place. So um, I don't understand why they did that, um, but maybe it was just one of those things where they just wanted, you know, some reaction from people. Um, cool all season but, uh, stuff. Because yeah, I noticed and- that with an intent, like I was looking at the projected starting lineup for the White Sox. They still have Gavin Sheets in right field. That's not happening. <laughs> I can confirm that to you. That is yeah, not happening. Is that, Gavin yeah. Sheets, it's a possibility that he may not even be on the roster. He could be a guy that they see for trade. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then they had Garcia, Louis Garcia as the second base. That's not happening either. So it's it's a work in progress. And that, that's why it's always funny to see these projected depth charts and lineups this time of the year when there's still so much more business left to be done. I wouldn't mind seeing Gary Sanchez, though, on the Cubs for the reasons you guys allude to, mm-hmm. though. And he's a guy that's not going to break the bank for you, if you will, as well. So if you can get him on a one-year deal for something like less than, let's say, $15 million, you you pretty much win it. You just take a flyer on him. And like you said, if it worked out, cool. If it doesn't, you can cut bait with him. Yeah, and, and um, real quick, actually, I lied. There's one more thing I don't want to mention with the with when it comes to the White Sox. Uh, th- there was uh, interest apparently, or there is interest with the Mets, um, and Liam Hendricks. And I was kind of wondering, what you and th- you and Gabe, uh, thought Chris is uh, because I had a buddy who was just you know giving me some ideas of what they could like ask for in a trade, 
And in my, you call me crazy, call me crazy. But we, especially with the signing of Correa, which again, we'll talk about is, and he's a, uh, this guy, and this guy I'm about to say, he's a free agent at the end of 2025. So there's some control there. Would I be crazy to say a one for one of Liam Hendricks for Jeff McNeil? Go ahead, Gabe. No, you wouldn't be crazy, but if they really want Liam that bad, don't just give me Jeff McNeil. No, oh, yeah, you're right. Give me, one, that, give me, give me, give me one of your prospects too, because they have several prospects said. that mm-hmm. could easily be had. They have mm-hmm. several catchers currently on their depth chart. It's not too much room for Francisco Alvarez to really get a lot of starts mm-hmm. there. He's one mm-hmm. of the top prospects in the Mets organization. The White Sox don't really know what their plan is for life after Yasmani Grandal. Should he not have a bounce back campaign in 2023? That could be your catch of the future. I like Jeff McNeil, though. I, I mean, he led the, the, the National League in bad depth. He's a hell of a hitter. Mm-hmm. And he could fill a need at second base right away. But I want at least an everyday guy and one of your top prospects. And if I'm giving up Liam Hendricks, who you're going to pair with Edwin Diaz to form one of the most nastiest eight, nine inning combinations in all of baseball, I gotta get something for that. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I can't, I can't dispute that. I'm not as up on the minor league system as Gabe. I, I went and looked up Brett Beatty, and so I would be asking for him along with McNeil because I think the Mets are getting to that point where they are good. They know they're good. Steve Cohen's willing to spend the money, and he has, for the time being, fixed their front office um, dysfunction. But they still went cold at the end of last year a bit, and they didn't succeed in the playoffs the way that they wanted. So I think that there is a potential for that drive to get the championship. Because even even still, I, I don't know if it'll change, but for the majority of baseball teams, they are kind of willing to ride that peak of competition, valley of tanking, um, you know, four or five year cycle. And the Mets right now are, are trying to get to the peak. So there's a potential for that drive to win consuming them and making some hasty decisions because, you know, as, as bad as I am at business, I know it's a game where you're trying to pull a fast one on somebody that you're working with, especially in sports. So you get, you get whatever you possibly can for it and give up as little as you possibly can. It would suck to lose Liam. He's a great person. And that's what I love about him more so than his passion on the field, even more so than that. But, and I think there's a weird potential for that to not work as well as the Mets wanted to, just because those two guys are closers. And as we saw with Craig Kimbrell, when you put a closer in a setup role, it doesn't always take. And you've already got Adam Adovino, you know, there's a lot. But you get whatever you can from them. So Jeff McNeil would be fantastic. If Starling Marte was two years younger, I would ask for him too. But Get us get a guy who can play right now, and get a guy who maybe a year or two away, and then ask for somebody else. Who knows? Because if you start high, then the most they can do is talk you down or hang up the phone. And I don't think the Mets are in the time period where they want to hang up the phone on anybody off the bat. Another name to keep an yeah. eye on too that the Mets have in their farm system is Ronnie Mauricio, mm-hmm. and he's a shortstop who, at some point they're going to have to move because they have Lindor. It's not enough room for everybody there to eat and to receive yeah. beneficial playing time. Like Eduardo Escobar, his market is going to be very hot. I could see teams like the Rays, the White Sox even calling about him because he's on the final year of his deal. He's relatively cheap. And, oh, by the way, his only way to get into the Mets lineup on an everyday basis now with Correa playing third, is being a designated hitter. That's like their only weak link in their lineup. Francisco Alvarez, I can tell you right now, is ready to play, in my opinion. I I believe he's ready. They called him up late last year. He could easily be slotted in as the backup catcher who becomes the primary catcher, depending on the health of Gasmani Montal. If if you're willing to give up Brett Beatty or Francisco Alvarez with a Jeff McNeil or Eduardo Escobar, you can meet one of your top prospects with one of your everyday guys, we might be able to work something out. 
Yeah, that's true. And that's and, that, and like that's what my buddy was saying too, is that they're not he doesn't just want McNeil, he wants, you know, some somebody else. And hell, even even like even and let's say, look, uh a prospect might be the smarter thing, right? But even if they were willing to give up like a Eduardo Escobar or something like that, somebody a guy that's versatile that could play multiple positions, um, even that would even that would help. But yeah, I understand the catcher one, I even the Alvarez one makes a lot more sense too, because you're all right, uh, Gabe, especially with you know, with the health of Jan, uh, uh, or sorry, Jan, of uh, Yasmani, or even, or even also, like, um, if they're thinking about, like, let's say they consider moving Yasmani Gandal, just, just consider moving him, right? If they got another catcher, or if they sign another catcher, just because of the, the, the deal he's on, even that would make a lot more sense. But, uh, Miles, what do you think about that? And do you think that, uh, you know, the one for one would make more sense, or do you think that they would still want more? And and if so, anybody from the Mets roster, not necessarily prospect wise, but if it was prospect, would anybody pop out to you from the Mets roster? Yeah, you know, I think I think in terms of just you know, if, if we're gonna give up a guy like Liam Hendricks, um, you got to give me someone who we who we can you know kind of build towards for the future. Um, kind of to alluding to what Gabe was saying, uh, I think I think it's important to for for a White Sox team that is still in the hunt with everything um, for them to be willing to, to, to give up a lot. You got to give me something back. You, you have to, because this isn't a team that's rebuilding. Neither one of these teams, in my opinion, are rebuilding. These are two very competitive teams um, who are going to be making some pretty, pretty good runs at it next year. Um, yeah. For me, it, it couldn't just be a one for one. It couldn't be, it, it could not be um, maybe, maybe for a ball's breaking on the roster and, and, you know, things aren't going well. We're trying to ship guys out. It doesn't really matter. This, this isn't the case with the White Sox. If, you're, if, you're, if I'm going to give you uh, my top closer, uh, one of my, my best arm out of the pen, you got to give me like three or four prospects at the least because in case you didn't know, bro, I'm trying to win my division and get to the World Series as well. No, yeah, 100%. And, uh, and one, one more thing before uh, we close things out is uh, we got to talk about the main story that happened in the last 24 hours, and that's uh, Carlos Correa, right? So he uh, was thought to have signed a deal with the Giants um, but the, you know, the, com- the press conference to introduce him was going to be on Tuesday. It was postponed or canceled, I should say, um, because it never happened. Uh, and overnight, I believe it was like, had to be like one or two o'clock in the morning. Uh, he actually signed with the Mets. So, uh, another big, you know, big deal, 12 years, I believe it was 315 mil, something like around there. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it's just another one of those Cohen deals. You know, he's going, he's going all in. Uh, throwing the cash at at all these big free agents, I mean, it, I mean, it, it's funny because we shouldn't be surprised, but I was surprised, um, and this just makes one of the best teams in the NL um, a lot more scary. And I th- I feel like they did this because I think a lot of people, especially with that Trey Turner signing with the Phillies, I think a lot of people were putting more respect in the Phillies, um, especially because they won the pennant, so rightfully so. But they were putting more respect on the Phillies than they were the Mets, kind of, especially after the Mets lost to Grom. Um, despite even getting Verlander. Um, so I, th- I feel like they, they felt a little, you know, like they were getting the short end of the stick. And I think now that you got Carlos Correa, um, I know that they definitely feel like the best team in the National League. So uh, we'll start with you, Miles. What did you think off the off the bat when you saw that news? Because I know a lot of people woke up to it. Um, and I don't <clears throat> I don't think it gets much worse than if, if you're a Giants fan waking up to that type of news, that's for sure. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> poor San Francisco the past few weeks. I've been, I've been going through it. Yep. Um, really weird stuff. Really weird stuff. Um, I wonder, it, it makes me curious as to the specific details as to what happened um, and how are the Mets kind of kind of monitoring whatever happened with that. I, I don't know. In my opinion, because, because there hasn't been too much information that's been released about it, mm. it's so hard for me to like uh, give like a concrete opinion but I, I hope for whatever it was, I hope the Mets kind of are keeping whatever it is in the back of their mind uh, for future reference because um, it's weird. That's a weird case. That's a really weird case. But I did see some comments online before, uh, before you know, Correa went to the Mets. Someone said this is all part of Steve Cohen's plan. So I don't know. If New York knows something that the rest of us don't, uh, good on them. But I don't know how people are I – don't, I don't know how people are predicting this. I didn't think mm-hmm. that he was going to go to the Mets. I just didn't. I, I'm, I'm honestly looking at the Mets. I'm like, okay, yeah, you know, they're pretty good out there. But um, it's funny how things work out. Steve Cohen is—he's he, a wizard. He has the money. 
uh, and he's willing to spend it. So it's it's very interesting. It's a very uh, entertaining entertaining thing to talk about. I would just love to know more of what that entailed. I don't know if we're ever gonna get it uh, or if I'm missing something, but um, it's very it's very surprising. Oh yeah, all, all they said all they said, and especially or the Giants, all they said it was a difference. Like obviously, you know, there's no details in this statement, but yeah. they said that there was a difference between the Giants. Uh, difference of opinions between the Giants and the uh, Korea camp uh, when it came to the physical. So, yeah, again, we'll, we'll, who knows? People think it could have been the, uh, I believe it, he, he had an injury to, I believe it was his shoulder. He had an, he had an injury that, that people, or, or his back injury, sorry. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's, oh, he's had a lingering injury that a lot of people think was one of the reasons why a lot of teams were scared to sign him last year in the yeah. offseason, at least for a yeah. long-term deal. Um. I don't think it's much of an issue necessarily, but especially because like p- players get used to it. People always talk about that with backs. They they kind of they kind of get like get used to like how to deal with it and stuff like that. So I don't think it's that much of a scary thing. But anyways, uh, Gabe, what did you think about that deal? Uh, as soon as you hear about it, man, y'all ever uh, watch Boys in the Hood? <laughs> and with uh, uh, Trey was in the car, they was trying to get revenge for Ricky's death, and he told yeah. no boy let him let me out. No, <laughs> Doughboy, let me out the car. do let me out. Yeah, don't let, let me out. Don't. I think, that, I think that's what I think that's what happened in San Francisco yesterday, man. I think that's what oh happened. I think Carlos Correa oh, realized, man. as much as you know, money is cool. It ain't everything. That's a guy that really is about winning. At the end of the day, and even though he was gonna be the man in San Francisco. I think he looked for any loophole that he could find. And when they gave him that loophole, he called Scott and said, hey, make that call, man. Make that call. And, and I think this was the call. Anytime a player who is an all-star, like Carlos Correa is, is willing to switch position and take less money, albeit a lot of money, less money in a pursuit of another World Series after missing the playoffs? Man, that speaks volumes. Mm-hmm. Steve Cohen, we've been known he out for blood anyway. <laughs> he just lost Jacob DeGrom. If that's not enough motivation, I don't know what is. They already had what I would consider to be a fairly solid offseason. They spent the bread. They re-signed them over. They signed <laughs> Cody Saint. They signed Justin Berlin. Sign Jose Quintana. This is the crown jewel. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it's like it's like Adam Sandler, a cut gym. This is how I win. <laughs> and, and, and he got him a W with it. And I, and, I, and I think I think Correa, he found that loophole, and he started thinking. Because that's a guy who this past postseason in October was doing shows on TBS. Phenomenal analyst work, by the way. Mm-hmm. You think he want to be doing that for the next several years? Hell Even if the no. check is nice? Hell no. <laughs> That's why he went to New York. Yeah. Mets still got to Mets still got to win though, man. The Mets have not been able to prove that they can win whether it's the regular season which they got through last year and then in the playoffs which they crashed out early last year. The Mets still got to prove it. Now, this is a way to do it, but Miles, I kind of want to ask you this. Is there any, what's the possibility on a percentage scale of zero to a hundred of disruption with having two natural shortstops of that caliber on the same roster? Well, I mean, it really depends on the shortstops. I really don't see Frankie Lee Lindor as like an egotistical guy. I think he's a pretty down to earth person. Um, I think it's been more proven that Correa has a little bit more of the ego um, not self-centered or anything like that, but he definitely has that more kind of has that more flair to him, uh, a little bit more outspoken in terms of what he wants and what he thinks of himself, um, a little bit more cocky, but rightfully so. Um, it depends. It depends on the shortstop. It depends on how good that they get along. I think it's going to be fairly low, but at the same time, the New York Mets is a team that has had a history. So we've talked about this. They've had a lot of drama over the past. However long they've been around, this is a team that has had drama. Yeah. Uh, ownership of players, whatever the case may be, staff. This is a team that's had many issues. So as much as I want to think to myself, I want to say, 
okay, they're not going to have issues. Um, I think both players are going to adapt well to each other. You put Correa at third base. You know, you know, Frankie's going to control shortstop. As much as I want to think for myself, I think this is going to go well. You really never know what's going to happen with the New York Mets. Granted, I think this past season they had was probably like, like the least drama I've ever seen them have. If they just focused on baseball and what did it result in 101 wins in the season? Um, we'll see. We'll see. We don't know what else. What else Correa is going to see, and he's going to be a little bit picky about. What, I want to play a certain amount of games here at shortstop. But I want to hit this part of the order. It depends. It really depends. To add that, to that's what I'm looking though, for. Yeah, but, but to add to Mal's point, though, I don't think America has seen a Mets team this loaded since the mid-1980s. Yeah. When you had the likes of Strawberry, Gooden, Hernandez, Carter, and the whole game, Lenny Dykes running them. And they had a lot of drama back then. A lot of drama. They oh, was on page goodness. six, probably, left probably and right. More, more the more, you know, drama. they just had a 30 for 30 on them. If you haven't seen it, yeah. check it out. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, they used to it. They used to it. And I think Correa is willing to put his ego to the side. Anytime a guy has been a shortstop and made multiple all-star games at that position, say, I'm willing to switch position willingly, and let you do your thing, Lindor. And for one thing to keep in mind, these guys are good friends, too. Both natives of Puerto Rico, they know one another. I think it can work. Will it result in a championship? Who knows? But you can't say that it's not due to a lack of trying on Steve Cohen's part in this Mets front office. Because they doing it. Yeah. Yeah, sure enough. Yeah, and, and, and that's the thing. It's fun, it's funny because they you know they added that that extra Cohen tax you know before the before the start of last year I believe, and it doesn't even matter. He went over that. He's like, you know what? <laughs> if you're gonna you know if you're gonna name one after me, I'm gonna go over it. You know, my, who it doesn't matter. So, um, yeah, they they really are. It's it's definitely the definition of uh, not. It's not for lack of trying. Um, but um, that that's a good place to wrap things up for this week's uh at bat baseball podcast. Uh, for the holiday special, um, we hope everyone enjoys their holiday this week. And uh, but yeah, Chris, there you go, there you go. I got a. I didn't have the Emperor's Christmas new groove. I just wore red the spirit. <laughs> I, hey, we'll take we'll take game. Don't worry, don't worry. My, my, yeah, my Stone Cold T-shirt was at the top of the. Was at the top <laughs> of the uh, yeah, but uh, we hope everyone enjoys their their Christmas and Hanukkah miles as well. Uh, yeah as well so uh i hope everyone has a great week and we'll see you next week